Hello, class. Welcome. I'm your, I am your instructor, Professor V. Lobos, Professor V. And welcome to Math 1325, right? Calculus for Business and Social Sciences. All right. So this week we're going we'll be covering, let's see here, homeworks one, two, three, and four, five, six, seven. All right. So um, for for extra assistance, right? These lecture videos are optional, but for extra assistance to help you better understand the material, right? Uh, you may refer to this video. I will be releasing a video per week. All right, our video per, per week, um, and the videos will be posted up by Monday, no later than noon, right, Mondays at noon. Um, so let's get started, right? Uh, by now, we should have already gotten started on our reading our book, or reading our book, going over the book, or, or also looking at the videos I have linked in your homework questions, all right? And I wanted to go ahead and cover some more questions that you may they, you know that that you may see right regarding the material, and as a refresher, right? Um, if you've noticed the homework that's that's coming up, right? Homeworks one, two, three. This is a refresher. We will not start the calculus portion of it until homework four, right? And one of the things I wanted to go go ahead and over, right, for homework one, was this question we have here, right? Question number one on homework one. Uh, a key thing to remember, right? Whenever you have anything to the zero power. Right, anything to the zero power, this will always be one. This is going to be one, right? Another example would be, well, what, Professor, what if I had negative two x squared all raised to the zero power? Uh, again, right? This here is one. Right? This here is one. A, another question would be, right, as a refresher, hey, well, what do we do whenever we have exponents with another exponent on the outside, right? So we see here, for example, x to the 15th power, right? We see here that this is raised to the fourth power as well. So is y to the 11th and so forth, right? Um, right, so I'm pretty much going to go ahead and apply this fourth roots to everything that I have on the inside, right? So it's gonna go to the x to the 15. It's gonna go to the y to the 11. Gonna go to that negative two. And it's also going to go to the z squared. Right. So one thing to remember is whenever you have double exponents like that, they multiply, right? They're gonna go ahead and multiply. So in other words, x um, to the 15, all right, uh, raised to the four, right? That's just gonna be X to the 60, right? Because whatever 15 times four is. Same thing with my Y's, right? This is gonna be Y to the 44 all over, ah, right? I have a negative number being raised to an even number, right? One thing to remember is if you have a negative number being raised to an even power, this is always gonna be positive. This is always going to be positive. If you have a negative number raised to an odd, the sign will always be negative. All right, so here I have a negative value on the inside raised to an even power, right? So I know my answer is going to be um, positive, right? And then I have two to the fourth power, which is 16. Oh, and I'm sorry, and I forgot the z squared also gets a four, right? And then that right there would be z to the eighth. All right. And in terms of simpl simplification, that's, that's as far as I can go, right? That's as far as I can go. All right. We're going to go ahead and I'll go ahead and someone has sent me a question regarding this problem, right? Right. Do I have, right? Because what I have here, right? Pretty much this is this. My trinomial. Where variable A is one sixth, variable B is seven sixths, and then C equals one. All right. Uh, so, yes, all right, to those who sent me the, this question, uh, can I use that quadratic formula? Of course, right? Very nice. One of the questions was do I have to use the fractions? Is there anything you can do to get rid of the fractions? Yes, right? Yes. Um, you're going to look at your denominator, all right? And we see here that the denominator is a six. Uh, an observation would be, what would happen if I multiply everything by a six? 
right? Well, what would happen if I multiply everything by a six? All right, if you multiply everything by a six, right? I'll let you go ahead and do that computational work. Your equation will now be n squared plus seven n plus six is zero. And hey, I'd rather use, right, use these instead, right? Go ahead and use these values instead. It's going to give you the same answer, right? Whether you use the top one or the bottom one, but right, it's going to be much easier to use the bottom one. So use the bottom one. Definitely use the bottom one. You're going to use your quadratic formula. Use the quadratic formula. Ah, greatest common factors, right? Another question that was asked, right? Um, what you need to go ahead and do here is factor, right? What's the most you can borrow from all of these? What, what's the most, right, um, that you can borrow from these terms, right? I have a group here, I have another group there, and I have another group there, right? Um, with these, you want to start off, you know, one at a time, right? In terms of numbers, right, what's the, the number I can factor up from both of them? At most, at most, right? it would be a two, right? It would be a two. Um, and then I'm going to look at the variables, right? Uh, I'm going to look at the x's. Um, what's the greatest x I can factor from all of these, right? Well, one has x to the sixth, the other one has x to the fifth, and the other one has x to the fourth. Well, the most I can borrow from all of them is x to the fourth. And for y, right, the most I can borrow from all of them are two, right? And we're going to find out what is left over. There was a two there. But I took the two out, right? So it's I'm gonna have no no uh, coefficients there. Uh, how about x to the sixth? Um, I have x to the sixth, and I took out four, right? And I get so x squared. And there was a y squared, and I took a y squared. Well, now there's nothing, right? So it's just that by itself. For the second group, all right? Um, I'm gonna have three x y, and then the last group right would be seven y squared and right well we know you can go ahead and, and check your work right you can go ahead and distribute this into here into here and into here and you notice that you're going to get this exact same thing i didn't get that exact same thing very nice in terms of one thing we are going to be going over this class a lot is going to be domain and range, right? You're going to see this uh, throughout the calculus course, the domains and range. So for domain, it's going to be your x values from left at least from left to right, right? So uh, right where the graph exists, right? This is where I'm looking at from where the graph exists, right? So if I look at this graph in terms of X, right? It starts at X equals negative one, all right? And I know that's closed, all right? Because it's a solid dot. And as a refresher, if it's closed, use a solid circle. You also associate this with less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, and you also associate this with brackets. All right, uh, if it's an open system, you use an open circle, less than, greater than, and you use parentheses. All right. All right, so that is why I use a bracket, right? I'm going to use a bracket for negative one because it includes negative one. And in terms of x, right, a negative one, zero, one, two, three. All right, it stops at x equals three. Ah, but three is an open circle. So I'm gonna put a parentheses for that. All right, so the domain is just the x values where that graph exists, All right? And for your range, you're gonna change things up a bit. You're gonna look at the y values from lowest to highest. All right, so in other words, now you're gonna be looking at your vertical ticks, right? You're gonna be looking at these values 
your y values, right? This is your x axis, this is your, your y axis. We're going to go all the way to the bottom, right, where this exists, right there. This is the lowest point where this graph exists. It exists at uh, y equals negative five. It's an open circle, right? So there's going to be a parentheses, and this graph goes all the way up to negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, four. Four is going to be my highest point, all right? Four is going to be my highest point. And whenever you're dealing with peaks or points, right, it actually passes through that point. So that means you can include that value. So that right there would be my range. Okay, one thing I wanted to go ahead and go over are domains for specific functions. All right, so for, for example, one. Right, I have a rational function, right? It's, it's, it's a fraction. What's one thing we can never divide by? Zero, right? I can never divide by zero. So one thing to remember, if I'm asking you to find the domain of a function, all right? I'm um, asking you to find the domain of a function and you see that I give you a, a fraction, you're gonna get the denominator and you're going to state this cannot equal zero. And then you're gonna solve, right? You're gonna go ahead and solve for X, right? I'm gonna go ahead and add six to both sides. And then you're going to go ahead and divide by 16. So I see here that X cannot be uh, six over 16, or in other words, X cannot be uh, three over eight. So X can be anything at once, except that value, all right? It can be anything at once, except that value, all right? So in, in a number line, how would this look like, all right? Well, three eighths is less than one, all right? So let's say three eighths is somewhere here. Let's say this is negative one. Right. I cannot be this. I'm going to create a little void. I'm going to create an open circle around that number, but it can be anything to the left of this. And it can be anything to the right of that. All right. So whenever I need to now give the domain an interval notation, right? That's what I'm asking for the domain and interval notation. Whenever you're reading your number line, right? Whenever you're reading your number line, you're gonna start again, right? Domains from the farthest left point to the farthest right point, right? Look at this arrow. This is pointing to the left, the far left. All right, what does that indicate? Uh, negative infinity, right? And this goes all the way up to three eighths. Uh, I need you to, right, to, to, to recall that negative infinity and positive infinity, since you cannot count that value, it's always going to be an open a parenthesis. And since three eighths was an open circle, since I couldn't include that, right? That's going to be a parenthesis. I'm going to create a little space here, some little wiggle room. Then I, I find out that I hop over it because I cannot be that number. I hop over to the other side and I continue from the other end of three eighths. And I go all the way to positive infinity. These two are also parentheses. And whenever you need to combine these, all right, you're going to go ahead and write the union. Right, there's a little union there. All right, so that's going to be your domain for rational functions, right? For, for fractions, your denominator cannot equal zero, right? Your denominator cannot equal zero. Another one, right? Another one would be. Go ahead and do E. All right, so this is out of the way. Let's go ahead and do E. All right, you have the square root of 16 minus 6x. All right, if you look at your square root function, all right, you'd find out that it exists from zero and it curves out like that. All right, so you can, we can you cannot take the square root of a negative value because you're going to get a complex number, right? And we're only dealing with the real plane, with real numbers, all right? So one thing you would do, right, to find the domain, all right, so let's just say, hey, you find that I'll give you a square root function, 
you're going to get everything on the inside of the square root. And we know that everything on the inside has to be greater than or equal to zero. All right. And then, right, you're going to go ahead and solve for x. Ah, all right. Um, whenever you know that, whenever you multiply or whenever you divide by a negative value, whenever you, the mathematician, you divide by a negative value, your inequality switches sides, right? Switches signs. Instead of now pointing to the right, it's going to point to the left. And 18 over 6, this gives me 8 over 3, all right? And just like before, right? So this number line is looking for everything less than 8 over 3, right? So again, I'm going to create my number line. All right, 8 over 3 is approximately 2.67. Right, so about here. All right, so I can include this. I can include this point and everything to the left of it. Right. Can click there and everything to the left of it. Awesome. Now I'm going to read the domain, right, in interval notation. Look at the graph that you drew, right? You're going to get, you, you right, it's everything to the farthest left, right? So the area, the, the arrow area, that arrow is pointing to the left. So that indicates this is approach, this is the farthest left point is negative infinity. With the parentheses, and this goes all the way up to eight thirds, right? Eight thirds, eight thirds is an open, it's a closed circle, right? So it's gonna have a bracket. So that right there is my domain in interval notation for square root functions, right? Square roots. Right, and last but not least, polynomials, right? Go ahead and do a few of these polynomials. All right, so if I asked you to find the right, something like this, I, I got my polynomial, or even, uh, let's create an, even another one as well, right? This is my, this is one of them. The other one would be negative five x to the fifth plus three x to the fourth minus 100 x to the third minus one, all right? These are both polynomials, right? These are both polynomials. The domain, the domain for all polynomials is negative infinity to infinity, right? Meaning all real numbers, all right? All real numbers. And if you're watching this, right, you can expect something like this on your first exam, right? Finding the domain of not just one specifically, but various uh, functions. All right. Now we're going to go ahead and find out. Uh, there we go, right? We're evaluating some functions, right? We're applying operations to certain functions. Um, let's go ahead and do the. Let's do the addition one, and then we'll do the multiplication one, right? They want me to find out what is f plus g of x. I'm gonna re. I'm gonna rewrite that, right? Because um, I'm not really used to seeing that, right? Uh, this is just, all this is, is f of x plus g of x. All you need to do is add two functions that are given to you. And hey, if you look at the top, look at your given functions, they tell you what f of x is. f of x is 8x plus 9. And you're going to add this to g of x. Well, g of x is... 5x minus 4. All right, you simplify. That gives me what? Uh, 13x plus 5. Yes, 13x plus 5, and that is it. That is your function. That is what f plus g of x is. All right. Let's go ahead and do this. We'll go ahead and do the second one as well, All right? If you have f minus g of x, right? You're gonna do the exact same thing, but you need to be careful. You need to go ahead and make sure that you 
add parentheses where needed to avoid not applying a sign somewhere, right? So for example, right, we know that this is just, I'm going to create a divider. This is just f of x minus g of x, right? right so I know that f of x is ax plus 9 minus, I'm going to go ahead and create a parenthesis, and then I'm going to plug in g of x, which is 5x minus 4. And it's very important um, because this negative here has to distribute to everything in the inside, all right? Having something like this would be incorrect, all right? It will not give you the correct answer, all right? So this is what I have here. I'm gonna go ahead and distribute to this negative inside and it gives me eight X plus nine minus five X plus 20, oh, plus 20, uh, plus four. Meaning this here gives me 3x plus 13 is my final answer. All right. And last but not least, I now have uh we'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and start this one off with you guys. Uh so four dots, four little right indicator multiplication indicator, right? Well, all that means is f of g, well no, f of x times g of x. Right. This here just means I grab f, which is 8x plus 9, and I'm multiplying this to g, which is 5x minus 4. All right. Um, what do we do whenever you got two terms, all right, that have two terms inside them and they're being multiplied to one another? All right. You apply what's known as FOIL. You apply what's known as FOIL, where it's first outside inside last and you simplify all right you only do this with multiplication and and that i'll go this is as far as i'll go all right this is as far as i'll go okay i have here then there was a question here no because that was my bad all right a manufacturer's manufacturer sells flashlights, uh, flashlight kits for forty-seven dollars per kit. Uh, the fixed cost, all right. The fixed cost, which doesn't change, right? This is important. Is fifty-three eighty, and the variable cost, right? Variable, it varies, right? It's going to change. Uh, it's twenty-seven dollars, all right. Um, I wish this wasn't here. Well, to find your cost function, right? How much does it cost, you know, cost you? You create an equation where it's going to be a number times X plus a number on the outside, right? The number you want next to the X is gonna be the value for your variable cost. And the value on the outside would be your fixed cost. Meaning, your answer here would be 27x plus 80. Your, your revenue function, all right? Well, right, that, that's given, right? Your revenue function, all right? It's gonna be the price of the item times x. The price of the item of the kit times x ends up being here, 47. All right. And now to find your profit function, profit equation, this here is just, you'll see many, all right? This here is, where is that? Your revenue function minus That is what your profit function is. The revenue minus cost, right? And that's going to give you your profit, right? How much are you profiting from, um, from, from the items that are being sold if you're profiting, right? So your revenue we know is 47X. And just like before, right? There's a negative with an equation, right? So I need to go ahead and create a parentheses. 
and my cost function is 27x minus 5380. Go ahead and distribute this negative in the inside. I get 47x minus 27x. Oh, this should be positive. Minus 5380, meaning my profit function is 47 minus 27, that is 20 x minus 5380. Right, and so right, right here, this is my profit function, right? If you're ever asked to find out uh, what needs to be done for you to break even, all right? Uh, the number of flats lights kit that the manufacturer must sell to break even, right? So where you're, where, where you're not losing money or making money, right? It's just it's, it's to break even, all right? You get your profit function, And you equal it to zero and you solve for x, right? So I need you to remember that, all right? Because uh, you will see this on the exam, all right? Um, all right, so you solve for x, you add 5380 to both sides. So I get 20x is equal to 5380. And then you divide by 20. Right, equal to. Sixty-nine. Right, so 269 um, flashlight kits must be sold for the company to break even, right? Meaning if you sell any less than that, so that company is losing money, all right? And anything more than 269, it's actually, you know, your profit money, right? It's pocketed money for the company, not for you, right? So, all right, so this completes homeworks of one, two, and three. And let's go ahead and get started on homework of oh, four, five, six, and seven. All right. Homeworks four, five, six, and seven. All right. Okay, so we're gonna be going to be ugh. we're going to be go be we're going to be going over composite functions, right? Composite functions, right? Um so here I write for the exam or for your homeworks, you'll see that I'll give you two functions, right? F, G, H, I, J, K, right? It, it can be any function, right? But it's 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 what the composite function um, states, right? The, 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 what, what I'll be asking, right? So for example, we'll go ahead and do example one. I have F composite G. Um, so that isn't a multiplication symbol, right? That's the composite symbol. And what does, I need to rewrite that just like the ones we just did, right? I need to go ahead and rewrite this, right? And you're going to rewrite this from far, from the right to the left or from the left to the right, right? All oh, this means is that you're going to have F and you're going to throw G inside of F. That's all it means. That means... Uh, moreover, right, what that means is wherever you're going to look at F and it's going to have some X's, all right? Um, and wherever you see an X there, it's where G is going to be being plugged in, right? It's where G is going to be plugged in, right? So what I like to do with these is, all right, so I know F is F of X. So this is 2X plus 7, right? Uh, to create the composite, right? So whenever I start doing the composite function, I get, I take all the X's away and I write some big parentheses. I leave it empty, right? I leave it empty. And then I know that those X's are being replaced by whatever G is, right? I know G is the square root of X plus three, all right? Um, the square root of X plus three. That's, um, I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite this. So this would be two square roots of X plus three plus seven. And that right there is my final answer, right? That, that right there is my final answer. Okay. And what I need to go ahead and do now, right? Is find the domain of my composite function, right? The domain of my composite function, right? And this is gonna be a two-parter, right? This is gonna be a two-parter. Um, the first thing you need to do is the one that you grabbed and put inside the other one, right, which was my G, the one on the inside, you need to find the domain for that, right? Well, we know that G was square root of X plus three, 
and you need to find, right? You need to find the domain of the square root. Ah, but you learned this in the previous assignment, all right? We said whenever you're dealing with square roots, you're just focused on the inside and you're gonna state this is greater than or equal to zero. You solve for X and you find out that X is anything greater than or equal to negative three. In the number line, this is going to be this and anything greater than that to the right. Sorry about that for outside fireworks. All right, like that. All right, I'm gonna hold on to that. I'm gonna hold on to that. You're then going to right. This is like I said. This is a two-parter, right? This is part one, and then part two. What you need to do is get the domain of your final function, right? The, well, my final function, right, which was f of g of x is two square root of x plus three plus seven. Is this a polynomial or a square root function, right? This is a square root function. So similar to before, right? You're gonna get everything inside the square root and state this has to be greater than or equal to zero. You solve for x, all right? You find the number line, all right? You go ahead and do your number line, all right? Nice, all right? And then you compare them both, all right? Where your, your domain, your final domain is gonna be where these two functions intersect each other, where the, these two functions intersect one another, right? You're gonna compare left and right. You find out that they both intersect at the exact same spot, right? They're the exact same thing, right? So your do domain in interval notation, right? Would be, I could include negative three, and this goes all the way up to infinity. All right, a, a, another greatest common factor, right? Another greatest common factor. Um, what do they all have in common? Um, you're, you're all familiar with this, I hope, by now, all right? All right, okay, so I have a word problem here, right? So again, something you can expect on your exam. Give me one second here. Yeah, we're welcome back. All right, so we see here that um, in section 5.1, you'd see, you go ahead and see more word problems, right? Specifically um, interest problems, right? Um, annuity problems, all right? So, right? These, these functions, right, represent Right, so your S is your future value, right? S is gonna be your future value. Your P is your present value, right? Whatever you're investing, the amount you're putting in. Your R value is your rate, right? It's gonna be given to you more likely in a percentage, right? You're gonna to have to convert that right into a decimal. T is time. And N is how much how much is something compounded, right? How often is it compounded per year, right? And this N can change based on right on the question itself, right? So if, if I were to say, hey, um, your the amount you play you typed in is going to increase at this rate, um, I can right? They can ask you, they can ask you annually, semi-annually or biannually, quarterly. Uh, monthly or weekly as well, right? Where for annually, your N is one, right? How many years are in a year? One, right? Semi-annually, right? This is two in a year. Quarterly, right? How many quarters in a year? This is four. Oh, daily is another one, right? Daily. A monthly is, well, there are 12 months in a year. Weekly, there are 52 weeks in a year, right? And then daily is n equals 365, 365, right? So looking at the question that I'm dissecting, right? Um, 
right? I see here with the raise every 12 months, right? Oh, this one's uh, every 12 months, right? Uh, sometimes they may use, I may use keywords like this, or, I, or I'll just tell you exactly, right? Is it gonna be monthly, annually, or for 13 weeks, right? So your end is gonna be 13, right? So my end is here is gonna be 12, right? This here would be, right? A monthly case, right? A monthly case. Oh, I'm sorry. Monthly should be 12, not four, right? Your rate, right, is 3%, right? But it, um, to get the percentage out of there, right? We know we need to divide by 100, all right? So you do not use percentage, right? You need to use this converted value, right? And then the present value, right, that's being invested, that's going in, right, is 6.50, 6.50. Where P or where your present value and your final value more than likely are going to be monetary values, right? Uh, 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 dollar signs, right? So, and they say here, all right, uh, the final hourly wage in ten years would equal which dollar amount, right? Or what would be the final final val amount value, right? When time equals t, right? So when time equals uh, not t, when time equals ten, right? Also, uh, it's ten. What do you do? You go ahead and plug this in, right? Go ahead and plug this in. Go ahead and plug it into your calculator, right? So my future value is equal to 6.50 times 1 plus 0 0.03 over 12 raised to the 12 times 10. Go ahead and plug this in. And you'd find out the answer I get is, uh, and it's dollar signs, right? So if we're talking about dollars, it has to be to two decimal places to round where needed. So I see I got eight point seven seven eight dollars and seventy seven cents. All right, so that's how much the hourly rate will end up increasing, right? Um, every twelve months, right? In twelve months, in the first twelve months, that's what it, it'll be. Where it where it will be. All right, uh, some logarithms, right? So another student had sent me a question regarding logarithms, right? Um, whenever you're trying to solve for x, and the x is on the inside, right? And you're dealing with logarithms, right? What I need you to go ahead and do is uh, change the form, right? This, you're going to go from logarithmic form to exponential form, all right? Um, we're gonna go, because exponential form is, it's, it's easy to view, right? It's it's easy to to see, all right? Um, trying to go ahead and get a, all right. It's easy to to understand values in in logarithmic form, right? It's an exponential form, right? So, all right. So, how does how do you how right? Um, how do you go from exponential form to logarithmic form, or from logarithmic form to exponential form, right? Well, from logarithmic form to exponential form, right? That bot, this logarithmic value is going to be your base, right? The same B that you notice on the other end, raised to this value equals everything in the inside, All right? So B raised to the C equals everything in the inside. And I'm going to apply that here as well, All right? We said my base, right, which is four raised to everything over there to the five is equal to everything in the inside. And then you solve, right? And then we solve. And hey, this looks familiar, right? Four to the fifth, right? If you go ahead and plug this into your calculator, four to the fifth, this gives me 1024. Is equal to 10x plus 19. All right, you subtract 19 to both sides. And you find out that this gives you 10, 0, 0, 5 is equal to 10x. And you divide by 10. And you find out that x is equal to 100.5. 100 0.5. Right, that's how you would go about those. All right, so hey, 
I'm also giving you a function, an exponential function. All right, you see E there, all right, your Euler's uh, number. And I'm told, I'm telling you here that P on the left hand side is population, and the X is years, right? The years specifically after 19, 19, 1900, right? Um, in what year? So that means I need to solve for X. Is the town's popul did the town's population reach? Um, what is that? Two million nine hundred and forty one thousand eight hundred fifty four. 853. All right, so I know P is equal to 1496 E to the 0.079 X. Um, what they gave me is uh, citizens. So I know citizens is P. So I'm going to make that substitution. Is equal to. Right, and then I'm going to go ahead and solve for x. Right, I'm going to go ahead and solve for x. All right, so whenever you're find, whenever you're solving these exponential functions, you want to get e by itself, meaning you don't want anything on this back end, and you don't want anything to the left end. Right? If it's on this end, right, and you're trying to solve for e, right, you're trying to get e by itself. Um, that 1496 is being it's multiplying with e. So I'm going to go ahead and divide both sides by this. All right. To get something to get rid of something that's multiplying, you divide by it, right? And two nine four one eight five three divided by six. This gives me nineteen sixty six point four eight is equal to e to the point zero seven nine x, right? I'm going to go ahead and switch spots. Right? I'm just going to just flip them over. They mean the exact same thing. E raised to the 0 0.079x is equal to 1966.48. Right. The next thing, if we remember, if you're trying to suffer x and it's an exponent, all right, if, it's, if it is an exponent, you need to bring that down, right? The only way we can bring it down is if you, the mathematician, you take the natural log to both sides. Natural log to both sides. Well, whenever you're dealing with logarithms, you know, you can apply what's known as the power rule, all right? which means whenever you have the natural log hugging a base and that base has an exponent, the exponents come out to the very front, right? So I have here 0.079x times natural log of e equal to natural log of 1966.48, right? Uh, we know that natural log of e, right? Is one of our identities. This always equals one, right? So I'm left with 0.079x is equal to natural log of 1966.48. Last but not least, right? I'm going to go ahead and divide by 0 .9, uh, 0 0.079. So x is equal to Natural log of 1966.48 divided by 0 0.079. And yes, right, I need you to simplify that, right? You're going to go ahead and plug that into your calculator. All right, so this here gives me x is equal to 96. All right, x is equals 96, but that's, that's years, right? That's years. Um, this equation was saying that. Uh, X is in years after 1900, right? So in 1900. So that means to find out what year they did it reach that population, right? I am going to get the year that they gave me and add it to the value that we found. So this means that the population, that was the population in 1996. Right? What was that about 25 years ago? Well, 25 years ago, right? Awesome. Right. Okay. Now, so now we start uh, section six. Right. Um, section six is where we already start diving into our calculus. Right. To to our calcul to the calculus portion of of the of the um of the class. Right. Limits. 
All right, so this is going to be the part one, the first part, right? And we need to understand limits to continue to the first, to the next parts, right? So one thing to remember about or to, to know about limits is if you see a limit problem, right? Plug it in, right? Or plug it in. Uh, what this is saying is, hey, you are given a function. If my number gets very, very close to negative nine, all right, from to negative nine, what is my answer? All right, well, what is my answer, right? So the first thing you need to go ahead and do is plug, plug in negative nine, right? And you're gonna find out, all right, if your answer is zero over a, a number, all right, that is zero, right? If, you're, if you get something like zero divided by three, your answer is zero. Right. If you get a, let's just say, a number divided by zero, and you don't, you, we're eventually going to start touching on these problems, right? Um, since we can't divide by zero, what does that mean mathematically? Uh, what you're doing there is nine divided by an infinitely small number, right? This here is known as infinity, right? This here would be known as infinity, right? This is one of these new concepts, new ideas that, that, we're, that we're beginning to, to, to go over this class, right? Um, but then if you notice, what happens here? Zero over zero. That is the problem. We cannot have that. That means, all right, that, hey, I didn't get infinity or negative infinity, and I didn't get zero. I got zero over zero. That's a problem, right? So that means you need to get your function and factor the top and the bottom and see if anything cancels out. Right. Well, my limit as x approaches negative nine, right? I'm not gonna take my limit yet, right? I'm not gonna plug anything in. I'm gonna find out if, if I can factor the top. Yeah, I can factor the top. I can factor out an eight, right? This gives me x plus nine. And I can, I can factor the bottom one, right? I can factor up the bottom one. The bottom one factors down to x plus nine times x minus nine, right? And then you're gonna ask yourself, my limit, you're gonna ask yourself, right? How can anything cancel out? Yeah, and things should cancel out, right? Things, things should cancel out, right? So now you read my limit as x approaches negative nine of eight over x minus nine. And then at this point, once you cancel out and once you factor and cancel out, plug in your limit again, right? I have eight over negative nine minus eight, or minus, minus eight, minus nine, which is negative eight over 18, which simplifies down to negative four over nine. That is your limit, all right? You need to show all this work, right? Uh, we're, we're in a calculus class. You need to show all, all your work, all right? Um, me giving you the question and you just writing negative four over nine, that's not gonna give you any credit, right? You're not gonna receive any credit for, for that for that problem. Uh, so so please be sure to show all your work and it's, you know, well-written, right? So where I can, it's legible, right? Legible, I can go ahead and understand your writing, all right? We have another one here. Oh. It's coming up. Okay. All right. So you, again, I'm going to be giving you the limits and right. And you're now going to be seeing these with piecewise functions. And what does that mean? Right. What does that mean? Um, you notice that the first limit, right? It's X approaches five and you see there's a top right number, right? There's a top right number. Uh, that top right value, I'm sorry, the top right sign, if it's negative, that means from the left, right? So that means you're approaching five, but from the left, all right? So in other words, what does that mean visually, all right? So let's just say you have five on a number line, you're approaching five from this side, all right? You're getting really, really close to it from this end, all right? If it's a positive, that means you're approaching it from the right side, all right? All right, so, so I'm approaching five from the left. 
and, and I have some parameters with my piecewise functions, right? I'm told that I can use the top one if x is to the left or if x is anything less than or equal to five, all right? And the bottom one states that I can use that one if x is greater than five, right? So if I'm approaching something from the left, that's less than five, right? So that's like 4.999, right? So that means I'm gonna plug in five to the top function, all right? And x n minus five minus squared. All right, this here gives me ten minus five minus twenty-five. All right, this here gives me negative ten minus thirty, which is negative twenty. All right, so whenever uh, you plug in x as x as x is approaching five from the left, you get negative twenty. All right, so, and from the right, right, we're approaching it from the right. So you're gonna plug it into the bottom one, right? So two times five minus seven is equals two, three. All right, and you might ask yourself, hey, what does the bottom one mean, right? Well, that means if you approach it from both sides, right? From, well, approach it, approach it from both sides, all right? In order, in order for, for that bottom one to be true, the top two must be true, all right? So, but I see here that as if, hey, you're approaching five from the left and it's giving you negative 20, right? So let's just say it's given somewhere down here and you're approaching X from the right and it's giving you three. Well, it's not a definite answer. Which one is it? Is it negative 20 or is it three, all right? Um, right, if it's, if it's something like that where the values are completely different, this is a does not exist. That limit does not exist. You'll find out that in order for, if the limit as X approaches a number from the left is equal to the limit as X approaches a number from the right, then that means that the limit as X approaches a number from both sides is the same, right? It's the same, All right? So I have another question here, right? Evaluate the limit, right? Evaluate the limit, right? What's the first thing we're going to go ahead and do? We said, hey, whenever you're giving a limit, plug it in, right? Plug it in. Let's see what it tells us. Right. On top, I get... Oh, zero over zero, right? This gives me a zero over zero case. Ah, that means I need to go ahead and factor the top and the bottom, if possible, right? Sometimes you only need the top or sometimes you only need the bottom. Very nice. I cannot do anything with the, with the bottom, but I can do it to the top, right? All right, you, you may do the AC method, right, to, to factor it, all right? If you're looking for two numbers that multiply to give you seven, but whenever you add those two same numbers, they give you eight. You find out that those values are one. These cancel out, they're the exact same, leaving me with just X plus seven, right? So that means I'm gonna look at my new limit now. My limit as X approaches negative one, of uh, X plus seven. What is that? Let's go ahead and plug it in. That's it. That's my answer. My answer is six. Oh yeah, there we go, right? My answer is six, right? So again, you need to show your work, right? Just go ahead and show your work. You, I'll go ahead and have you do this one as well, right? You may pause the video, all right? Um, so you can go ahead and attempt this one, right? The, your answer is here as well, right? This is why I have these answers there for you, right? So you can pause the video and do it on your own. Right. Can you have another one like these, right? I have another one like these, right? Same idea, right? And sure, it looks a little bit different. I'm not dealing with X, but plug it in, right? Plug it in, show your work. You find out that this gives you a zero over zero case. Um, right, generally what you want to go ahead and do is simplify as, right? You want to really, really simplify, right? That's what you want to go ahead and do. You want to go ahead and simplify, right? So 
I'm gonna, what I really need to do, right, where my focus is at, and I need to expand the top. I need to get rid of the parentheses and combine like terms, right? Um, so that four plus H squared, that just means I have two of these. Um, I know that whenever I have two of these, all right, I get to do FOIL first, outside, inside, last, all right, that there you'd find out gives you 16 plus 4H plus 4H plus H squared minus 16 all over H. Okay. You'd find out that the 16s cancel out leaving me with just um, the limit as h approaches zero uh, or oh that's 8h right that gives me 8h plus h squared over h the next thing i would want you to find is factor the top factor the top all right the limit as h approaches zero this gives me there. Ah, what happens? Your H's cancel out. Leave you with the limit as H approaches zero. H plus H. And at this point, plug in your limit, right? Plug in your limit. So this here is H plus zero, which is eight. So eight would be my final answer. Very nice, right? So this is one of those other ideas that I, I wanted to go over, right? Right. If you're approaching x zero from the left, you use the top one. If you're approaching zero from the right, use the bottom one. If I'm asking you a function at zero, like f of zero, you use the middle one, right? You use the middle one. All right, so I'm asking you, hey, I want to know what the answer is whenever x equals zero, right? Okay, so that's 14. And right, and the other thing I want to know, right, is what is the limit as x approaches zero? All right, well, there's one thing I need to do first. I need to find the limit as x approaches zero from the left first. And then I need to find the limit as x approaches zero but from the right, all right? So whenever I approach it from the left, I'm going to use the top one, all right? So I get 5 times 0, 14, which gives me 14, all right? In other words, in order, in order for the limit as x approaches 0 to be true, both of these must be true, right? Both of these must be the exact same value, and it's going to go to that value. So if it's on the right, I'm going to use the bottom one, 4 times 0 plus 28, this gives me 28. These are not the same. These are not the same, right? Meaning, that this does not exist, right? Meaning this is not continuous, right? This is a jump, right? Right, meaning that my answer is probably something like this. And then there's a jump, right? Um, so as I'm approaching zero from the left, it's 14. But as I'm approaching it from the right, I get 28. So I get something like that, right? It's not continuous. Continuous is something where you can draw a line. And without picking it up, you can continue drawing the line. But if we see here, I have to pick up my hand in order for me to continue. Um, so this here is not continuous, right? And there's a few videos that I put on your homework uh, that you need to go ahead and watch to, you know, to determine if something is continuous or not. Um, Right, so like here, right, like here. For example, whenever x equals two, as I'm approaching, right, as at x equals two, right, at x equals two, as I'm approaching two from the left, what y does it get close to? So as a limit, as x approaches two from the left, my y, right, is what, negative one. Now I'm going to do the other. As x approaches 2, but from the right, this 2 from the right, this also looks to be going towards, towards negative 1, right? Ah, so this means that the limits as x approaches 2 from both sides goes to negative 1. 
that's very nice, right? So this is a case where, hey, what happens if they're the same, right? Um, but there, you see now notice that there's a dot, right? There's a dot. This dot represents your function at two, right? Whenever it is exactly two, not approaching, whenever it's exactly two, what is the answer that gets spit out, right? That is negative three, right? That is negative three. Uh, so in other words, this is not continuous, right? This is not continuous, right? In order for something to be continuous, right? The limit as x approaches the left, the number from the left must equal the limit as x approaches the right, must equal the limit, right? As x approaches a from both sides, must equal the limit, the function at that at that at that x value, right? At that x value, right? But since these aren't the same, right? This means this function is not continuous because there was a hole that was removed. Uh, I may ask you, what would be, what would have what would the where would this dot have to be at for this function to be true? All right, it would have to be here. It'd have to be somewhere there, All right? So in other words. Uh, this answer would have to be f of two would have had to have been negative one, all right? They all had to have to share the same y answer for this to be true, for this to be continuous. All right, uh, I have another example here, um, right? With what I just said, right? I'll go ahead and let you all um, pause the video and attempt this one, all right? I'll let you pause the video and attempt this one and let me know, is it continuous or not, right? Is it continuous or not? The answers are there, all right? On what domain is the function continuous, right? On what domain is this function continuous, all right? So one thing that you need to go ahead and do, right? One, one thing that we said was you get your, right? If we're talking about domain and, right, domain, in, in continuity, right, they're, they're, they go hand in hand, right? Well, again, what would you do? You're going to get your denominator gonna equal it to zero, right? You're going to state cannot equal zero, and you're going to solve for it, right? You find out that x cannot be one. So if you drew your number line, it cannot be one, but it can be anything to the left, it can be anything to the right. Meaning an interval notation, right? Your domain is can be anything from negative infinity up to one, union one all the way to infinity. Right. So that would be your domain. That right there would be your domain. All right. Um, right. Um, again, right, another a refresher, right? Tying it in, in the first three homeworks with homeworks four, five, six, and seven. Um, how do you find the domain of a square root function, right? Of a square root function. You get everything inside the square root. And you state everything must be greater than or equal to zero. All right. Now I'll let you go ahead and solve that, right? This is, at this point, this is a refresher. And another reminder, right, that if you're dealing with polynomials, right, um, they are continuous, right, from negative infinity to infinity. Right, that is all I have for you today, this week. Um, I'll go ahead and just as a reminder, right, I'll go ahead and try to have all the video lecture videos oh, oh, by Sundays, if not, right, then by Mondays, Mondays at noon. And if you have any questions, please do not uh, hesitate to, to reach out to me, right? I am here to help you succeed, right? I want you, I want you to learn um, to get, you know, right, to gather a thing or two from this class. Um, and that is all I have for you all today. Thank you very much for your time and hope enjoy, you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.